Okay, I want to talk about um, the history of science. I want to talk about the spread of innovation. And the kind of questions I want to talk about in this talk are how do new scientific topics arise? How does interdisciplinarity play a role in this? And what makes a new field cohere? And I want to begin with a conversation I had as a postdoc. I couldn't find a picture from exactly that year of either of us, but close enough. Um, and so I had a conversation with Morgan where I said, oh, I'm going to build a new language model. And I know about parsing, so I'm going to build it with parsers. And, and I know I need numbers because this is speech. And so I'm going to make up a number for each of my rules. And Morgan kind of looked skeptical. And he said, gee, shouldn't you use actual probabilities? And I said, oh, that's kind of a neat and new, exciting idea. I'll go learn about probabilities. And that's what I did. Um, so I, that seems like it's a personal story. But I want to talk about how that personal story changed the world. Um, and I want to start with a metaphor, because I've been thinking about food lately. So I'm going to spend five minutes talking about food. And you'll see why it's relevant. So um, this is America's National Foods. Um, and um, you can see from the names that we are a country of immigrants. There's hamburgers, there's frankfurters, there's french fries, and there's ketchup. And for some of these, there's Hamburg, and there's Frankfurt, and there's the kind of French area. Now, <laughs> I, I know Hervé, french fries are Belgian. But um, <laughs> close enough, close enough. OK. So but what about ketchup? All right. So quick story about the history of ketchup, right? So you're a fisherman. You're living, say, 2000 BC along the coast of southern China, Southeast Asia. You're speaking one of these languages. Um, and um, you have to preserve fish to make it through the dry season. So what do you do? Um, you do this thing that people actually still do up in the hill tribes. You layer the fish with rice and salt. The, you get this lactic acid fermentation of the rice. The fish ferments. It sort of tastes like ham. And it's me mentioned in old Chinese um, ethnologies of the region, and it's still like people still up in the hill tribes of Guangxi still make this kind of fermented fish. Very old dish. So then what happens? 200 BC, China expands from the north down into the south into this region, invades what was these tribal areas of modern Fujian and Guangdong provinces. As, you know, locals get assimilated or pushed down into Southeast Asia or up into the hills. And this assimilated fish spreads around. And in fact, it spreads very quickly to Japan. So by 700, this fermented layering of fish and rice moves to Japan, where it's called Nara Zushi, the ancestor of modern sushi. And then the modern version of the story is that slowly this dish changed. So instead of using lactic acid fermentation to make the rice sour and the fish sour, people just added vinegar to the rice. And um, as refrigeration happened and ice became easier to transport, then we started eating fresh fish. So this modern dish is, is descended from this, you know, this a uh, very old fermentation process. But meanwhile, so that's Japan, but meanwhile, back in this southern region, I've shown you a little map here. So here's Guangdong and Guangxi province. Um, um, these kind of fish, pre uh, preserved fish dishes, fish and shrimp pastes, are used for all sorts of cooking. And there's another paste made from when you make wine, the, the, the stuff at the bottom of the wine barrel, the lees, are used to also ferment um, fish products. Um, further south, well, this is China, further south along the Mekong River, so now it's Cambodia and Vietnam we're talking, they um, invented a fish sauce, which was a, a clear, not the pasty full of fish things, but a clear liquid. This is the vats that they make fish sauce. That's me next to the vats they make fish sauce in. It looks kind of like a wine barrel. Um, and um, uh, so these fish sauces um, were, were spread around the world. And what happened was Fujian is a coastal province, and there's mountains. Um, that, uh, that uh, make separated from the rest of China. So it became a very isolated province. And it became a seafaring province, because there was no way to get to places by land. Um, so Quanzhou, the, the main seaport at the time of Fujian, was the capital of the Maritime Silk Road. This is how everybody got to Asia um, from, from China. And from that port, the Fujianese and Cantonese, the southern Chinese, sailed all around Asia. And they brought this fish sauce from what, what is now Vietnam and Cambodia up north. And they started using that fermented red rice and cooking. This is a fermented red rice with chicken. It's very delicious. And there's the fermented red rice over there. And they settled around um, Southeast Asia. And the stars are places with large ethnic Chinese settlements um, throughout Southeast Asia. So Java and Malaysia and, and, and so on. So um, at the exact same time as this is all the spreading out is happening, Europe um, um, it starts expanding. So 1600, the British, the Dutch, the Portuguese, they're sailing to Asia. They want all these new Asian products. Textiles and porcelains have been invented. And you're a sailor on this ship. What are you going to drink? Um, the beer goes bad. The wine goes sour. They hadn't invented hops yet. Um, so, And they get to Indonesia, and they find ethnic Chinese making um, a, 
a drink called Eric, the ancestor of rum. So it's distilled from red rye, the same red rice, the lees of which they use for food. Um, the word Eric turns out to come from an Arabic word. The British start buying this liquor because the British are very excited, like they, they haven't had liquor yet. Gin hasn't been invented. Um, it's great for the navies. You know, you can add it to water, it kills germs. Um, and a bunch of factories um, start uh, distributing it. It becomes the common drink of Europeans all over Asia. Um, and in fact, in an aside, it, it was this liquor that limes for scurvy were added to to create the world's first cocktail, which is called punch. Anyway, while they're buying this Eric, the British picked up all this fish sauce that w was being made in all the region. And in the local Chinese dialect, Hokkien, which is the word in Fujian for Fujian, um, and it was called ge zhup, ge meaning salted fish, and zhup meaning sauce. Okay, so they bring this salted fish sauce home, okay, and, um, and uh, this was a very valuable commodity. So here's a, um, you, can, you can read now these accounts of these traders from 1700 um, traveling around Asia and talking about um, how they brought this fish sauce home. And, the, and here's a quote from one of them. He says, soy comes in tubs from Japan and the best ketchup from Tonkin. Tonkin is the north of, of Vietnam, now what we now call northern Vietnam. But good of both sorts are made and sold very cheap in China. So he was in Hong Kong buying fish sauce. And he also says, I know not a more profitable commodity. <laughs> so you have this expensive imported luxury. People are bringing fish sauce back from Asia all the way to, to London. It's very expensive. What do you do when you have an expensive imported luxury? You have knockoffs. <laughs> so very quickly, there are fake ketchups. Here's a recipe for an English ketchup. S strong beer, anchovies, mace. And you can see at the end, this is the key. This is thought to exceed what is brought from India. Clearly, they're trying to copy an exotic, expensive import. And this recipe changed over the years. So first we had these anchovies and beer, and then they started, uh, there's a walnut version. This is from Jane Austen's family recipe. Walnuts and vinegar and nutmeg and horseradish. And then um, tomatoes came from the New World and they added tomatoes. And, um, and uh, so if we summarize this, we have an anchovy, we have the original sort of fish sauce. We have the anchovy attempt to, to recreate it with beer. We have a mushroom version. We have a walnut version. Tomatoes come in. Then right about just before the Civil War, the tomatoes disappear, the anchovies, sorry, disappear from American ketchup, so it gets less fishy. And then um, sugar gets very cheap, and we start adding a lot of sugar in the US. And, and that's the modern, your modern ketchup is really kind of a tomato chutney. It's really just a sweet and sour tomato sauce. Um, so it's changed very much. So um, this actually has larger implications beyond just th these facts about ketchup. Um, uh, the model of world history that I was taught in high school is the Ming Dynasty comes to China, 1450, sinks the navy, declares it illegal to ship, and, um, and China kind of sinks into economic irrelevance, and Europe drags them into the world economy in the 20th century. Um, and it turns out this just isn't true. So there's lots of revisionist history, and ketchup is, a, is an example of the kind of thing. If you read these same reports of these, of these British trailers going to Asia to buy all this fish sauce, they complained that there were thousands of Chinese boats in every harbor they were in, from Burma all the way east to Java, um, dominating the trade. And you can measure all this dominance of trade. So basically, until very late, like 1700, China completely dominated the world economy. And if you add Bengal in, China plus Bengal completely dominated. So the reason the British and Dutch were so eager to get to Asia is that's where all the manufacturing was, right? You, the Industrial Revolution hadn't happened yet in Europe. China knew how to make ceramics and textiles, silk, and then cotton in Bengal, fermentation, ketchup. Um, so it's the drive for this Chinese market. It's the drive for ketchup, for example, that drove Europe's complete exploration and colonizations. So the name of our sauce, the name of ketchup, is the story of economic domination of the world by a superpower, which is China, not us. Um, but also, and now I'm, I'm, now I'm getting to the relevance for today, um, the ketchup, a recipe is just a technology. Recipes change over time. Um, there was like a, this fermented fish and rice, and there was sushi, and there was this clear fish sauce, and there were these various, you know, ketchup-y things that turned into modern ketchup. And basically, we're just borrowing foods from the neighboring people and adapting them and messing them up. And I want to claim that this ketchup theory of innovation applies to the history of science. Um, for non-recipes. And I want to talk about how innovation happens in science, the role and the role that Morgan played, and how um, ketchup elucidates that. Um, and so, oops, so um, this is a, a bunch of papers which, uh, with a bunch of collaborators, um, including David Hall, who's, um, in, uh, who is here at Berkeley, um, and a bunch of students and collaborators at Stanford. 
Um, and here's what we did. We looked at the um, reference corpus for the ACL, the Anthology of Computational Linguistics, and that has about 20,000 papers, and people have built the citation graph. Drago Radov at Michigan has built the citation graph, so we know it for every paper who cites it. The text of the papers are online, and then we, they have disambiguated authors, and we added gender to every author. So we know who wrote the papers, what the, what the gender of the authors are, who cited whom, um, in every paper, in every journal and conference in the field. All right, so then, um, given this whole large set of papers, we ran a whole bunch of models. So one of them is LDA, topic modeling. So as most of you know, or if you don't know, I'll tell you, topic modeling is simply a word clustering algorithm that you give it a bunch of documents and it learns um, uh, two kinds of models. It learns what a top, it, it induces a cluster of words called a topic, which is a set of coherent words that tend to occur with each other throughout the documents. And then it induces a clustering for each document, it induces a distribution over, over topics. So let's assume we have a, doc, a, a, a document here, and LDA will induce that, this, that there are 70 topics in this collection, and it'll say doc, document three here is heavily loaded on topic two. There's a lot of words from topic two. The topics are just unigram distributions over words and um, other topics it's less loaded on. So we'll learn both a set of topics and then for each paper, which topics it's more or less about probabilistically. Um, so here's an example of what I mean by topics. Topics, again, they're just unigram distributions over words. So here's a topic we called statistical missing translation. It has the word blue and the word statistical and the word source and target and SMT. And here's a summarization topic that talks about summaries and topics and, and stories and so on. And you can see, um, uh, areas of the field learned by these topic models. All right, so we learned these topic models, and what um, David Hall had this intuition that we could describe a year in history just by the distribution over topics of the papers in that year. He called this the topic zeitgeist. So if we look at what people were doing in this literature in the 1980s, they were working on logic and formal semantics and, and representational semantics and lots of dialogue, and they switched by the 1990s to working on probability and classification. And I have a little graph of that. So here, this older method is the story understanding method that I was trained in in grad school, um, and which died out, although the happy ending is it's coming back in a different way. Um, and, um, and the blue line is all of these probability and classification topics. So if you look at the curve, there's, a little but there's some kind of a knee right here, right around 1988, 1989. And we call that the statistical revolution. Something happened in natural language processing in 1988 or 89. And so to find out what, we just looked at those years and looked at every paper that was heavily loaded on the new topic and asked where did these papers come from. Um, and, and if we, we just read the papers and looked at the authors, um, and here's a list of the kind of papers, the very first part of speech tagging, statistical part of speech tagging paper, the first machine translation statistical paper, and so on um, in 1988. And it turns out that of the, the top 10 papers, almost all of them came from, from people who places like Bell Labs, places like IBM, from researchers, all of whom were trained in electrical engineering or speech. So basically, all of these papers came from speech, speech people who went to a computer science conference. So um, they, by, by basically moving to, going to a new conference, bringing the math to this new conference, they, um, this kind of interdisciplinarity created this scientific innovation. So, and, and grad students at the time borrowed these new models and started adapting them. All right, so that's part one of this history, but all I've told you is people worked on topic X in this year and topic Y in that year. Maybe it's just accidental that the topics changed. We could do better if we could actually look at individual people and say what did they work on this year and what did they work on in, in the next year. So, um, so now instead of tracking of just measuring which topics are being published on in which year, we're gonna track how people move over time from topic one to topic two. Um, so we're gonna start by clustering the years into groupings, because it'll help us in tracking. Um, so here's a heat map that says, if I was working on, on my distribution, a topic distribution is just a 70 probabilities, just a vector of probabilities. How much was I working on this topic, that topic? And now we can just look at the, at the, at the similarity of those two vectors to ask, in 1980, how similar was what people worked on to what they worked on in 2005? Not very similar. And um, you can see that there are, um, along the diagonal, there's lots of uh, regions where people were sort of working on similar topics. And if you run clustering on these kind of heat maps, um, you end up with a kind of um, 
epochs, like a, re, a, a area of time when they were kind of working on similar things, and then another area of time, and then kind of a nothing area kind of here, and then a modern kind of coherent area. So they were sort of confused in that third period. And we labeled these periods. Um, the early period, the bake-off period, which I don't have to define for this audience, um, <laughs> the, the, this kind of weird transitory period, and then what I call the modern period. Um, and you can do this clustering in a number of ways. You can do it by the topics, by the citations, by the people movement. You kind of get the same four clusters. So this is like a new way of thinking about how to find epochs in the history of science. Anyway, so, so we know something happened special in that bake-off period, because um, that bake-off period is the period in which, 1988, which this stuff happened. And then there was this incoherent period right afterwards, followed by the modern coherent period. So let's, we want to drill down into that a little deeper. And so we ran another kind of clustering, and this fl clustering was on people's flow. So two, I cl we cluster two, um, two years, we cluster two groups of papers, or kind of, we cluster groups of people such that, you know, group, we, groups of topics such that people moved from another topic into them and from that topic into the next topic coherently. So two topics are similar to the extent that people worked on similar things before, then worked on those, then worked on similar things after. So we're asking, we're, we're clustering on flow. Wh which things are people likely to tr pass through the topics are people likely to work on? And we got nine clusters of topics inversely ordered by time. So this is oldest. So these early natural language understanding, um, uh, uh, story understanding uh, algorithms that I was trained on. Then here's the Bake Office number eight. Then some other early topics, and then some more more recent topics, big data topics like like machine translation and 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 all the all the classifications. And then you can plot that on a graph. So here's the nine topics, and over, these are snapshots over time. This is this is eighty between the the the, the four the four year period eighty to eighty three and the four year period eighty four to eighty eight. And it, where a node is a topic and an arrow is people who worked on that topic in this four-year period also worked on that topic in this four-year period. So people were working on these early natural language understanding topics. There's a big weight of people kind of staying and working in them. And they're beginning to shift to some of these other topics. Finite state automata became popular. People worked a little bit on discourse and uh, classic parsing. This is like old-fashioned uh, parsing. And then um, four years later, they start working. They start moving toward the bake-off. And then um, now we're, we're sort of from the bake, in, in the middle of the bake-off years going to the end of the bake-off. And you can see everybody's working on bake-off topics. And there's a huge bunch of people keeping working on bake-off topics. And then from there, the people move out into these, what we might call modern topics, probabilistic modeling, classification, and machine translation, and so on. So it's as, we call this the hourglass. That's my little hourglass picture. Because the bake-offs basically drew people in, because, presumably because of funding. They were required to work on these things for their grants. They had to work with each other on these new topics that the ideas propagated through these people and then um, the, the, the new field sort of blossomed from those bake-offs. Um, and you can look at the very modern years and see that, that this is not so modern, but this is uh, um, say five years, as, as late as five years ago, um, you can see the modern sort of four clusters of topics. People are moving back and forth among them. Um, this graph would look very different as of a year ago because there would be a huge topic for um, deep learning. Um, all right, but going back to topic eight. So this is the bake-offs. Everybody has to work on shared tasks. Every, as you know, everybody has these benchmarks. Everybody has to show up at these um, Merrill Lynch workshops in, in Princeton that we all had to show up at. Um, and, and innovation is a, a great way for propagation. If you had a successful innovation, it, it got replicated. Um, you can also look at the modern field by asking how similar are pairs of conferences in the field. So if you take a conference as a distribution over topics, you can just do Jensen-Shannon divergence between the conferences, how similar are conferences over time. So similar, similarity is down. And you can see that the, the main, the, all, each pairs of the three conferences all the, are converging in their topics. So conferences are, the field is cohering more similarly. The gender balance of the field, is, uh, which is still bad, is getting uh, uh, hugely better. So this is the red is female authors, green is, um, Colorblind, but I think that's greenish yellow. Um, the uh, the uh, the the um, percentage of female authors went from like it's like 13 here to like 26 in about 2009. So um, indication that the field is cohering in some way, and you could also measure just individual bodies um, coming and going. So this is author retention, which is if you published a paper 
in this set of conferences in year X, how likely were you to keep publishing a paper versus never coming back and ever publishing again in the window of this study? Um, and you can see that overall, the retention is going up. People who published in 1980 were sort of not that likely to come back. They might kind of come for a year and then go away. But now, kind of people who publish keep publishing. They're, they're in the field. And you can also see this little bump. Um, that's the Bake Off bump. So that's all, um, who are those people that came, uh, were, were religiously attending the DARPA conferences and then just went home afterwards? Um, and that was the speech people. So, um, because speech people were required by um, Charles Wayne and, and so on to um, show up at these DARPA conferences, and afterwards they just went home. So, people came in and the bodies mostly went home. Not everybody, some of them stayed. Mari's still here. Um, but, um, but, uh, but, but in particular, even though some of the people left, all the ideas stayed. And we call this the pollination model of the spread of innovation. So, there's an alternative model of colonization where people change a field by going into the field, writing papers, staying there, having students. And this was not that. People mostly came and mostly went back. Um, so, um, so lots of implications. One is just history of science. Um, Peter Brown and, and Bob Mercer specifically said that they would not have published the statistics of machine translation paper if Charles Wayne hadn't personally um, required them to do it. He just yelled at them until they published it. That was what they said. Um, that he said it was important to get that to the to the rest of the field. Um, so people from another field um, come in, and, and, and in particular, people physically moved, right? People actually went to a conference where grad students from the other field were and presented papers and talked to them in the hallways. Um, so physical movement was an important part of this. Um, so so um, another uh, uh, summary from the work is um, we could do history of science computationally. So we can look at, um, uh, all these data sets of citations and, and gender and so on to so find an innovation, trace it through people, um, and measure coherence of a field. So the, the reason I call this the catch-up theory of innovation is in catch-up, we saw that this technology change over time. People would borrow a recipe, they would adapt the ingredients to their local thing and keep changing them. And as with computer science, with catch-up, people physically moved. People had to sail to Asia. It was much easier in 1988. You just had to go to, to Princeton. Um, and, um, but still, it was physical motion of people from another field um, causing innovations to get borrowed and spread. Um, and so to return to my conversation with Morgan at the very beginning, it was Morgan, uh, you know, I, wasn't I was trained in story understanding, and Morgan said, oh, you can't just use random numbers. You have to use probabilities. Why did he say that? Because he was trained in that. Um, and and uh, so these ideas spread, um, and you can, see, you can see in our interaction uh, a, a small case example of this general trend that happened throughout the whole field. Okay, stop there. I am four minutes early if you want to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. I just talk really fast. Yeah. Dan. Right, right. Right. There were tons of other topics. I should have left this on, I just realized. Um, there were, there were, so there were 70 topics, and I picked the two. I picked the probabilistic one because that's kind of the point of the paper, and I picked the story understanding one because that's what I was trained in, so it's kind of a good story. But, um, but there were tons of others. Let's look at the graph. Maybe I can, I can remember some of them. Um, so, um, there, so machine translation, there was dialogue. So there was, a, and there was like unification grammars, which had actually a big, which was popular like right here. So there's a big hump for unification parsing. Um, there was tree adjoining grammars, which was kind of big here to here. Um, so there's tons of topics that, that rose and fall, and I really just picked these two because they make a lovely graph. And because they're personally, those are, this is the point of the talk, and this is just personally relevant. But I, and just to, yeah, the happy ending part is I have had students who worked on and, and are still working on things like story understanding, but kind of viewed more modernly. <laughs> No, no, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. 
no, that's a great idea. And we could almost do that from, I mean, if they were publishing, then we can see it from the from um, where they're publishing from. Um, and, and some of them were publishing. Yeah, nice. Just another comment. Um, and it was the end of the Bake Off period with the Gothic Network adopted the idea of uh, two translations and up and down from one to finance. Right, right, exactly. So we could look at, yes, we could look at finance too, yeah. Yes, and we actually we have it's a, no, it's a great suggestion, and we have this data. So we just started this. We if you're looking for postdoc in this area, if you're interested, we have the pat all we have Web of Science, which is the um, Thomson Reuters database of all articles ever published in their database. We have um, patent we have patent data, and we we have grant data, um, and so we're trying to integrate that for all fields, not just for for this subfield. But that then it gets the graphs are huge, and for computational linguistics and speech, I understand the field, so we can like. You know, label the topics accurately. When you start running over all of science, then I, I can't tell one subfield of biology from another, um, and we're sort of running into problems with this. But yes, um, that's that's the right next thing to do once we figure out how to deal with large data. So I have question. Okay. Um, this is like a free test. Um, can can if there was something you know, can you replicate the results? That's a great question. Yeah. Can you predict which innovations? Will um, will succeed and which ones will die. Um, we didn't try that. We didn't try like just building classifier and seeing if we could predict a future topic. That's a great idea, actually. We didn't even just try it. We could have just seen if it would work and throw in some network properties and some people properties and age of people. You know, maybe we know the age of everybody because we we know the, not their age, but we know when they start publishing, so we could estimate their age. And you know, if it's you know if it's a bunch of grad students, will it will it keep going and things like that? That'd be cute. Yeah. Nice. Oh, so you're asking really, Jordy, you're, you're, yeah, you're asking the, the same future question, like can we predict where innovation is going to come from next? Um, right, I don't know. Um, and it would be, yeah, that's, that would be a great thing to study. Like what, if, if I could figure out how to do it, yeah, build a classifier to tell you not, I mean you can certainly see, okay, you can certainly see the rise of China in, oh, I'm out of time, okay, I'm going to finish. You can see the rise of China in the ACL. The percentage of Chinese authors is growing hugely. Um, so that suggests that the answer is yes. But, um, but it's not growing quite as fast in things like most cited papers and things. So hard to know still. Morgan. Very quick comment. Um, well, I did know something about the Nice. 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 It all comes from Hervé. Thanks.